Okay, so my name is Francis Mattis, and I'm the Vice President of Engineering at Pensando, and I'm going to give you a technical overview of the architecture um, that uh, Prem and Sony spoke about. So as a systems company, we go from transistor all the way to RESTful API, so we're covering the entire stack. And so I'm going to start at the bottom. So when we started the company, uh, we started looking across the hardware landscape to see what, what were the trends and, and where was technology heading and, and how could we exploit 16 nanometer technology that gives you uh, much uh, better density and performance relative to uh, previous technologies. And so we started looking at this and figuring out how could we get this programmability while still giving you very, very high performance. And so if you look at how we fit into this landscape, uh, what I'm trying to show you here is a is a relative scale of the of the cost versus uh, flexibility and feature capability. Uh, we start with standard NICs. Those are things that uh, connect to servers today. Uh, sometimes they're uh, ALOM, sometimes they're land on motherboard, sometimes they're adapters. They give you TSO, they give you RSS, they give you basic NIC connectivity to a net device in Unix. The next level I would call, or what the industry is calling smart NICs, and maybe some custom ASICs. And these are basically standard NICs, but they have uh, additional offload, um, perhaps, and a C of ARM cores or C of processors. Um, in these architectures, um, most of the offload is around a flow table. Uh, these give you the capability to do things like OVS offload, um, maybe even uh, RTE flow, uh, where the flow table is the hammer and every protocol is the nail, so to speak. And so uh, this obviously has uh, a um, significant uh, problem when it comes to scalability uh, in terms of uh, state explosion, the multiplication of different fields within a flow table, that's one thing. And then the second thing is that uh, you have issues when you start to miss in these flow caches and you have to go to software, you start to get high jitter and high latency. And so what we wanted to do was bring the capability to provide flow tables in a flexible format, which is what P4 does, and also give you the ability to lay out um, pipelines, pipelines of multiple tables, multiple uh, lookups without, um, burdening the performance. And so that is where we are today. Um, so from a scalability and performance perspective, uh, we believe that we're uh, significantly better as Sony was showing you in the previous slide. And um, last thing I want to point out is uh, there's also FPGA based solutions today. While this offers a significant amount of flexibility with respect to what logic can be laid down, um, Let's say that uh, the issues with FPGA are around the density. Uh, it's roughly 20x um, density ratio of, I would call, uh, purpose, purpose logic versus uh, FPGA logic. Also with that, you get uh, very high uh, power relative to the performance. And so, and so you basically what you see is that uh, FPGAs are uh, not only cumbersome in that uh, you need Verilog and, um, uh, let's say a high sophistication for programming and then for uh, skilled operation for maintenance and sustaining. So with that, we're going to go into uh, what we were talking about in our design, Capri. Capri is the code name for the first generation ASIC built in 16 nanometer. Uh, what we've done is put in four independent P4 pipelines. Uh, these are very high bandwidth pipelines that provide uh, up to 24 stages of processing. Each stage can do up to four match actions in a clock. That can give you a total of 384 outstanding matches uh, in parallel, along with roughly um, 112 packets being processed independently at any one time. So very, very high throughput. Um, the pipeline is designed for a 100 million packet per second throughput. Um, that's basically one packet every eight cycles. Uh, but because it is programmable, uh, we've given you this ability to trade off uh, feature richness uh, versus performance. And so that's a very important aspect of programmability. Um, there's a, a typical curve that shows you uh, uh, as the number of instructions increase in a processing thread, the performance goes down. And so we give that type of flexibility that software has, uh, but because of the hardware pipelining, uh, and the hardware scheduling, uh, we give you uh, a much better performance. The other thing we've done is we've extended P4. Uh, we've brought a significant amount of innovation uh, to P4. Um, the first thing we've done is our machine target has a run to completion model. 
that again gives you the benefit of being able to trade off uh, different area, different um, dimensions of performance versus um, uh, features or, or richness in, in how, how much work you do per clock or per stage, I should say. And so that's, that's very important. Um, we've extended tables um, beyond a typical SRAM table that's very close. We've extended them to HBM. This gives us the capability to do millions and millions of flows, uh, millions and millions of routes. So we'll talk about that in a bit when we talk about the, the scale in space. But the point I wanted to make here is that um, unlike a, uh, a switch that has um, very, very tight SRAM uh, tables in a, in a very constrained area, um, we are innovating in that we're putting our memories uh, in large DRAM. We've built in hardware mechanisms to make sure that we have lots and lots of outstanding reads, uh, that we take care of the read after write dependencies that you get in a pipeline when doing stateful processing, which brings me to the next point. Um, we've also added the notion of stateful processing to P4. And that's really as simple as the pipeline can update state. So beyond counters and meters, um, you can do things like maintain uh, TCP uh, sequence numbers, uh, update sequence numbers. This gives us the ability to terminate protocols like TCP or RDMA to be able to do TLS proxy, uh, a much higher level uh, processing than just your standard L4 type of processing for switching and routing. We've done this all in, in a fairly low power um, area, as, as Sony was saying, around 25 gig, we're a little uh, under 20 watts and 100 gig, roughly 30 watts, uh, depending on the workload. Typical power is definitely under 30 watts. And most importantly, uh, we've done this uh, with very low jitter. So the latency uh, is around three microseconds as she showed in the previous slide or, or in her last uh, slide. But what I wanna get here is the point across is the, the jitter and this is fundamental. So when you compare uh, this type of architecture to a flow cache or even um, an offload that is off the PCIe bus where most of the information is stored in host memory, every time you miss in that cache, you need to go refill it. And that can include a software process. It can include uh, punting the packet to software and processing it on the CPU, or it could be some state machines that have to go do a, a cache line fill. Whatever it is, um, it's going to introduce jitter. And so a very important uh, part of this design is uh, having low jitter. Very important when you have very, very large millions and millions of flows, perhaps maybe in a 5G-like application um, on the edge. And then lastly, doing all of this in very high bandwidth, uh, meaning the, the 100 gig rates, um, being able to process packets at, at hardwired speeds with this flexibility of, of software. And so the right side is basically a block diagram of the chip with, these, with the, with the uh, main blocks highlighted. Uh, it's basically on the left is a P4 uh, subsystem, a switch, um, that we brought uh, these innovations around. Uh, the last piece I want to say about P4 is that besides extending to those three areas I discussed, we've also extended it to being able to do flexible DMA, and I'll get into that uh, now. Um, hey, in, Francis. Hey, Francis. Just, yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to clarify, and I, I think it's fairly obvious now, I wasn't sure early on, but th this seems to be all about networking workloads, so specifically around packet-based switching type things. Going a little bit into layer four activities, like you mentioned things like being able to terminate TLS workloads mm -hmm. directly into the card. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but it is all specifically around that net network side of functionality. Network not... and storage. So um, we okay. provide uh, networking and uh, storage services. And then within that umbrella of message processing, we provide uh, security. So. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about now are the different services that we provide. But okay. yes, this is an Ethernet device. Uh, it's, it's interfaces are Ethernet on the bottom and PCIe at the top. And that gives us the ability to plug in the computer so that we can provide PCIe services to that computer. Um, we have a very rich set of PCIe services, um, starting with uh, DPDK and your standard NetDev kernel driver. Uh, we can export NVMe devices. Um, we can export Vert IO or VMX Net devices. 
We can be a storage offload. We have one customer where we're being used as a storage offload and uh, we pro provide a storage offload device or a crypto offload device, uh, embedded HSM device. Uh, there's lots, the, the entire PCIe services mechanism is soft and um, we can define that uh, when we boot the card and, and, and uh, flexibly provide these services, which is very important. So that's what the host seeds. Yes. Francis, if I may jump in and say that, you know, things beyond layer four, there is a keynote talk in P4 Summit coming on 29th, but certainly we could do, uh, you know, layer seven uh, related elements. I'll talk into more details there. So far we have implemented TCP stack in the pipeline completely, like segmentation, reassembly, timers, uh, you know, all those kind of things, uh, sending packets out, uh, originating packets, terminating packets, those kind of things. There is also, uh, you know, NVMe is a stateful protocol beyond, you know, it's a very, uh, and that's implemented uh, implement, implemented in the pipeline itself. Uh, TLS is, is another big thing that we have implemented in the TLS. So it goes way beyond classic layer four. Hey, yes. Real quick, can, can, let me jump in for just real quick. One second, I just need to ask something. I feel like I've missed something. Um, and I just want to ask, is there more to this and how we leverage the functionality that this brings to um, the data center? Is there more than the management front end that you that was talked about initially? And is there more than just the card that goes in the server? Is there software, is there something else that ties all this together? Or is it literally just on program mag programmatically configuring the card and letting the flows flow through the card and handle all of those extra things it's trying to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think Francis, you want to take it or, I mean, um, we, if it's something you're going to cover later, I can definitely stand down. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. So, I mean, we're walking through the stacks so that we're starting at the very bottom with the hardware. Okay. We're going we're gonna to discuss all of the software. So clearly these arm cores that I'm showing you here run a significant amount of software on them for the purpose sure. of orchestrating, configuring, and, and exposing these services to, to, the, okay. to the end okay. user. Okay, yeah, makes absolutely. sense. Absolutely, yeah. I, I just wanted to bring that up because I'm just sitting here. I'm like, I, I'm missing something, and it's yeah. catching me oh. up. So I'll stand down for now. So carry oh, okay. on. Thank you. Okay, quick, um, quick question there. Sorry, yeah. just a quick one. Um, to, they're down as the RMA seventy two. Um, uh, do you have other options, or is it all based on the A seventy two? Because that's a relatively old version of the Cortex range right now. Um. So this chip was designed in uh, 2017, 2018, and at that, at that time, ARM A72 was a state-of-the-art ARM uh, microarchitecture uh, mm -hmm. for embedded systems. It's a very high-performing architecture, um, relatively speaking. It uh, gives you uh, super scalar, out-of-order microprocessor behavior. I think it's a three-issue machine. Uh, might be greater, actually. I can't remember the detail of the amount of issue. The ARMs in our architecture, unlike other smart NICs, are really there just for the purposes of aiding the P4, doing some connection setup, some management. The bulk of the data is data processing is done in the P4 pipelines. Um, and okay, know. yeah. So, so how 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 do we compare? So, what are the P4 pipelines then? Uh, as a uh, what would I compare them to if I was trying to benchmark what they can, what they're capable of? Because um, one of my questions while we're putting it, posing it on Twitter is, say, the, the problem with specialized devices is generally their lifespan. So I can go and buy ASICs now and, and other FPGAs that do a single purpose job very, very well. But they might last me six to 18 months. Blockchain is a great example. Um, as the difficulty increases, custom hardware becomes obsolete. Now, that's a very similar situation that generally happens with other FPGAs and things. So if I go and if a new compression algorithm comes out next year or a new deduplication method or the things that you are doing, if they change, is this capable of moving with that? Um, can I reprogram it? Is, is it? is it going to have a lifespan? Great question, yes. So um, when it comes to protocol processing, which is what changes the most frequently, I would say, in terms of VXLAN versus Geni versus, you know, uh, different types of encapsulations and overlays, um, that is all handled in P4 programmable processing. 
on the on the let's say the hardware acceleration engines like uh, CRCs, dedupes, SHA-2, SHA-3s, uh, all of your block ciphers, uh, AES, GCM, those kinds of things, those are actually hardwired engines in the, in the device where if we were to come up with a new encryption algorithm that did some kind of new polynomial arithmetic, say, um, that would actually be a change uh, in, in hardware because to get those things to run at 100 gig rates and beyond, they must be hardware. Now, what we've done is our PCIe interface, um, as one of the services we offer is that it can be bifurcated into an endpoint and a root complex. That gives us the ability on that root complex to hang off a small device, if need it be, a FPGA, sometimes called a sidecar. So that if you wanted to add a new encryption algorithm or added a new compression algorithm, you could do that. If you wanted to add NVMe drives for the purposes of uh, local NVMe virtualization, you could do that. Um, if you wanted to add some kind of uh, coprocessor that was doing the latest, greatest um, encryption algorithm or, or, or integrity checking algorithm, you could do that. So, so we've added the capability to the architecture for it to be able to enhance and be scaled from the hardware uh, perspective. But from a packet processing perspective, it's all in P4 for the most part. 99% uh, of the bulk work is done in P4, and that is all soft. And so we think that this architecture has uh, long, long legs. It's not something that you will be replacing in uh, 18 months. Francis, I have a question about, you know, different generations of your card in, uh, in the same data center. I mean, you start with this card, and in one, two years, you will have a new one. So you introduce something that is more powerful, that can handle more traffic probably, faster and everything. <clears throat> can the, so did you think about uh, a mechanism to you know, maintain some sort of compatibility? I mean, also from the performance point of view, because Absolutely. you will have some inconsistencies in, you know, especially because you're talking about working at the line rate for, for some, some of these protocols. So some of the encryption, some of the, so you, you are very fast and the next generation will be faster. Correct. And how will you manage all this inconsistency? So the most important thing is, is yes, the next generation will be faster and that will take the, the natural progression like any silicon does, whether it's a server, a hard drive, a, a, uh, or an offload device, that it will keep up with the next uh, level of feeds and speeds around 200 gig, around gen four, um, things of that nature. But more importantly is that the software, the entire stack that runs um, in the Pensando system uh, is backward compatible. And so uh, that's a very important point. Uh, we made sure that uh, we paid special attention to that so that all of the services, um, all of the offerings that we provide uh, are go forward in, in our new designs as well. And the difference that you will experience is um, in scale, both in space and time, whether it's bandwidth or whether it's table size. So yes, lots of, lots of thought put into that. And just one more. Sure. This one's a bit of a hypothetical. If general purpose quantum computing comes along tomorrow, are you dead? Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> When you say comes along tomorrow, uh, yeah. yeah okay, so let's say I can fill my Amazon data center with cheap general purpose quantum computing. Because all of the things that you can do specialized hardware, quantum computing takes the, that, that problem away. The calculations of those things become a general processing problem. Can I jump in, Francis? Yeah. Sure, please. So <laughs> if applications go to quantum computing, the needs of network will also require that level of quantum computing. So which means that all these services need to be offered at a much higher level. So we could leverage that technology to build the, the technology and the software and all those things using that. And that's instead of trying to be scared from it, we, we could leverage it actually. Okay, that's a good answer. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So what does all this mean for us? So basically, uh, I think this, was, this is where we're getting to. Uh, the question was, well, what does this all mean for me as a, as a user of your technology? Well, what it means is that uh, you would basically, um, you would purchase our management system, you would purchase our cards uh, through uh, a service vendor like Sony was discussing earlier. You would install these in your network and then you would boot the system. And once you booted the system, you would get 
different levels of service depending on what uh, you've enabled and, and what is available in, in the current software package. But the services we're providing are around IO processing for network, storage, and for security. And so uh, whether the networking is, uh, I need uh, a, a, a virtual bridge and a virtual router, um, whether I need uh, access control lists, uh, natting, um, overlay networking, where we can do flexible end cap and decap, being able to put VXLAN headers on or MPLS over UDP, Geneve, uh, these kinds of things. Um, being able to run a, a, a EVPN control plane for, uh, for TEP uh, distribution, uh, things of that nature. Uh, load balancing, all of these uh, are networking services that, that we provide at very high rates at very high scale. Uh, which is um, obviously very important as you begin to scale out your, your network. Um, built into all of this is security, uh, whether it's um, booting the card uh, for, with a secure boot mechanism so that we know that all of the software that's running on this card has been um, signed and verified, um, whether it is uh, crypto cryptography for both uh, asymmetric or symmetric ciphers needed in TLS, those are all offloaded in hardware for very high performance rates, um, or whether it's a stateful firewall or um, micro-segmentation. All of these security features, again, are implemented in the data path uh, written in P4, so they can be easily enhanced um, and easily uh, up upgraded. And then one of the most important parts that we bring uh, at the edge of the network is the notion of observability. So today in a network, if you want to look at packets, um, you turn on something called port mirroring. Um, that has to be done pervasively through all of the switches typically. There are limitations in top of rack switches today uh, and most shared memory output queued switches will have a limitation on, on the formats that it can mirror and how, how precise it can be and what it captures. Sometimes it's only sampled um, as an example. So what we can do at the edge is we can capture all of the packets and uh, export them in, in, in a flexible way. Today, we're uh, in our offering, we're supporting ER span. Uh, we have NetFlow capability. And so this gives the operations uh, very tight and very uh, fine grained visibility into uh, what's happening in the network. And then last but not least are the storage services. So we have quite a bit of storage services. Um, we talked about encryption for uh, networking around uh, TLS, DTLS, IPsec, but around storage, we have um, what's called XTS. This gives you uh, data at rest encryption. Um, this can be very useful if you uh, want to be able to encrypt block storage to drives. We have a customer that's using it for that purpose. Um, along with this uh, encryption, we can do uh, compression. We have uh, LZ compression in the device, again, for block level uh, encryption, I mean, uh, compression, all of this being done at 100 gig rate. Um, so very important. When Sony talked about the power of AND, all of these features that we're talking about can be operating concurrently at 100 gig. So um, in her first uh, slide where she showed uh, the different levels of um, service that can be offered, today in a network, those are endpoint devices for which you typically trombone into and out of. I go to the firewall, I go to the load balancer, um, I go to the storage endpoint. Here, uh, what we're doing is we're allowing all of these services to be chained at the edge um, for very high performance and uh, easier manageability. So that's the whole idea of what we're trying to do by providing all of these scale out uh, services. So to give you an example of the types of scale we're talking about. It, for um, instance, before you yes. go on to that, could, yes. uh, back on security yes. on the previous slide, can we talk about uh, hardware root of trust a little bit? We had a question come in from Twitter. Sure. Uh, is the NIC platform able to act as a hardware root of trust for the- It is, it is. So what we have is we have a, um, a technology called PUF, which is, stands for physically unalterable function. It is a way for the chip to boot at time zero and create a key based on uh, some technology around SRAMs. And what that does is it gives the, the chip a private key or a private signature that is a secret only to the chip. And from that key, we can begin to derive new keys uh, for storage root keys, for example, attestation keys. We can create um, public-private key pair, 
key pairs for uh, for signature and for uh, setting up TLS um, uh, sessions. And so this becomes the root of trust with respect to all of our secure boot processing. If you want to um, debug the chip, uh, we have uh, debug certificates to allow you to be able to get into the um, debug window. So very much uh, secure. Uh, all of our algorithms are NIST certified and we are in the process right now of being FIP certified. I have a question as well. Um, so there are so many services that you're running on this card, obviously, um, so many widgets. The more widgets you turn on, uh, the more processing you need. Um, so how do you actually work out how much, well, what, what amount of processing you need or what model of a card? How do you size that? How do you measure? Correct. Yeah, so it's a good question. So. Um, so you look at, first of all, what, what are your operating speeds going to be? Are you going to be running at 25 gig? Are you going to be running at 50 gig? Are you going to be running at 100 gig? That sets the bar for what the packet per second rate is. So for example, at 100 gig, the maximum packet per second rate possible theoretically is 150 million packets per second. So that's the first metric you look at. And then you say, how many times do I have to process a packet for each service. So if I'm doing four services, that means I need to do four operations and I wanna make sure that I have four pipelines as a, as a simple way to think about it, that I can run these packets through each doing its own type of work in a pipeline fashion so that you still maintain the throughput, which means you eliminate the dependencies. First I do, uh, you know, maybe I do uh, encryption or maybe I do compression and then I do uh, checksumming and then I do, uh, deduplication and then I do um, uh, compression, uh, whatever that chain is, um, you want that chain to be in a pipeline so that at any one point in time, everything is overlapped uh, and you see the full pipe uh, running. Um, and that is really comes down to the internal bandwidth of the chip. The chip internal bandwidth is uh, 400 gig. The P4 pipelines run at 400 gig. Um, our network connectivity, we have internally that shared memory output queued switch I showed you earlier and a network on a chip that gives you 3.2 terabit of bandwidth. So that gives you the ability to 3.2 terabit, if you're gonna run 50 gig, uh, you can do the math, that's basically eight, eight times uh, you can move a packet around while still maintaining line rate. So we've really built this design so that we can run a bunch of chains um, concurrently while still being able to meet the line rate, which requires a significant amount of speed up, I guess, to get to, the, to answer your question internally. By the way, this is Prem. We can also do the traffic management for each of these traffic types. So if you say don't allow more than 20% of storage traffic, 30% of Ethernet traffic, you know, we can do all that kind of traffic management and traffic shaping in both directions. Yep, significant amount of metering, rate control, and uh, QoS policy that can be applied as well. And just maybe one clarification you want to touch upon is um, the acceleration engine bandwidth is separate from the P4 part. I mean, you could do 20 P4 functions uh, in the chain without really counting into that eight uh, that you were talking about, the acceleration function. Maybe you want to touch upon that. Yeah, so what, uh, what Vipin is saying is that um, our P4 processors are basically uh, pipeline units that can have multiple threads outstanding. And so you could have uh, concurrently running through the P4 pipeline at, at different phases or at different stages, uh, an RDMA application, a TCP application, a classic NIC application. Um, you could be doing multiple different types of work concurrently. Uh, on the different stages, which is uh, inherently the parallelism that's that's in the design. And that's independent of the bandwidth um, on the accelerators that are running at, uh, you know, 100 gigabit or 200 gigabit, or independent of the NOC and the memory subsystem that's running at 400 gigabit and beyond, so. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it's so just one way of throttling it then. Uh, yes. A quick yeah. question from me. So in, in the yes. storage world, for example, does the data need to come in via the network on the card or could it come in from other interfaces and then be passed through for processing and then back again? Yes. Yeah, so the typical flow would be um, on a, let's say um, take a storage um, application. You would have a host uh, computer like an x86 
which would be running a volume manager or some type of storage controller and would pass the data to the card through PCIe. Um, that data okay. could be block data, um, variable size blocks, 64K, 32K, whatnot. And that's done through DMA. Uh, that's a PCIe service that we provide, as I mentioned earlier, um, where the host is running a driver and uh, using that to get to the card. And then starting a chain of services programmed through the DMA uh, rings. Okay. Okay. And so I noticed you also, you, you said you support PCI 3 and 4. Yes. So do we get significant benefits of AMD-based architecture over Intel? No, um, uh, there's a skipping. Well, you get, I mean, AMD today is what has Gen 4. So yeah. uh, you do get, yes, uh, obviously Gen 4 will give you um, a little lower latency for the same bandwidth, or it'll give you twice the bandwidth for the same number of lanes. So, yes. Okay, good. So so theoretically, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Right. So theoretically, you could use this as a pure uh, PCI offload card to implement whatever functionality you Correct. want. Correct. That's exactly right. You could do that. That is a mode of the card, and we actually have a customer that does that for some of the chaining services. Um, you could theoretically do it for storage. And in fact, in practice, we do. You could theoretically do it for TLS offload uh, for all of the uh, asymmetric ciphers required for uh, key generation, uh, which are very, very compute intensive. Uh, we run those in tens to hundreds of thousands of uh, operations per second on the device. Do you have any use case where you need uh, cards on, on all the servers uh, in, uh, involved in the communication I mean, to, to get advantage of some of the functionalities? Where you need a car, card on the servers? Yeah, so uh, the Pensando card on the on the server that is you know sending yes. data and uh, and also on the on the other side where you're receiving the data. So is there any functionality that? Oh, I see. Um, yes, so there is some functionality where we would need to be on both ends. I think that that's the that's the way I I, I read the question. Um, we have some uh, we have enabled some RDMA extensions, uh, which if you were to turn on would require. Uh, Pensando uh, devices on both ends. Uh, those RDMA extensions are for the purposes of um, alleviating the need for um, PFC in the network, which can be cumbersome for large RDMA scale out networks and for a more advanced congestion um, management algorithm. And in that case, you would need uh, Pensando on both ends if you were to run those um, extensions. But other than that, uh, there's uh, no, it's, there's no uh, need per se. Okay, all right, good questions. Okay, so uh, going back to uh, the scale, this is just to give you a sense of the types of scale we're talking about. Um, and again, these are all at the same time. It's not, I get uh, some LPM or some ACL. Uh, this is, I can give you an LPM route table I can give you a uh, ACL table. I can give you a, a flow cache table, uh, tunnel tables, um, uh, endpoint mapping tables. Uh, so just, just to give you a sense of the type of scale, uh, we're talking about millions and millions, tens of millions of, of entries. Um, whether uh, you're running one flow or you're running a million flows, the performance of the device doesn't change. That's very fundamental. Um, in, in the architecture and the design. And that, again, allows us to do this uh, power of AND. So looking at that, uh, it looks like I could, if I would be so inclined, build a router out of this. Absolutely. But of course, then the question is, uh, I get the packets in and I don't want to send them out through the same interface. So I need multiple of your cards in the system. Can I just connect them directly together or does the whole thing have to go through the CPU and the main memory in that case? No, you could, you could, connect, you could uh, connect them together through a network. That's one way to do it. But you could also provide uh, what's uh, traditionally um, called a router on a stick function where you go in one interface and you come out another interface. And uh, that's, a, that's a very popular model and, and we support that. Um, so we could sit off the side of a switch or we could sit off the side of a computer and you could come in and come out um, across the interface. So that, that's a fairly standard model for implementing a router and, and we certainly uh, have use cases where that would work. 
but I couldn't use the PCI bus as sort of the switch fabric. You could, you could, you could in theory, absolutely. Yeah, you could you could connect a bunch of these to a PCIe switch, and 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 we would be able to make that work. Absolutely. Interesting. But Ivan, yeah. historically, anybody who tried to do networking using the PCI switch failed uh, miserably. We saw this in 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015. People were trying to do it, uh, you know, and that didn't really work very well. So I think the networking will be probably a better choice. That may be our bias, but uh, that's the way we see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so the, the 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 last slide and and um, one of the most important slides is how does all of this come together? So, uh, on the right side of this is what you see um, the full architecture in that. This chip I just described called Capri is what is on this DSC card, this uh, distributed services card, which is a PCIe card that plugs into your server or an OCP card. That card uh, for it works with all the other um, servers in the system that have these cards to form a cluster, a cluster of um, Pensando devices that provide all of the different services we've been talking about. The way these services get uh, orchestrated or controlled, uh, how they get configured, how the user um, interfaces with it, is all through what we call the PSM, which is the Policy and Services Manager. So this is a service, a microservices-oriented uh, architecture built around uh, Kubernetes, um, where the user interfaces to this PSM through a RESTful API. Uh, this gives us a uh, this is a very highly available, highly scalable architecture. Uh, we we build these PSMs in in, in clusters. Uh, the minimum is uh, three. That forms a quorum, which gives us the ability to have a very high uh, availability. Um, we have extremely high scalability today with a thousand, and we're moving to three thousand uh, very quickly. Um, this gives you secure and um, uh, uh, let's say uh, life cycle management for the purposes of um, upgrades and downgrades. Uh, it gives you um, security in terms of how the PSMs communicate with each other and how the PSMs uh, communicate with the DSC. So this whole management plane uh, is intended to provide an operational model for enabling these services. Um, it's all policy driven. So that means that if you basically, you're, you're mapping out a declarative or sometimes called intent-based model where you define uh, your policies, whether they're security policies or telemetry policies. Um, these, get, these policies then get taken in by the PSM and um, the associated DSCs are updated. And that's all done within the subsystem of the PSM and the DSC. 